This video is meant to serve as an introduction to capacitors as entitled right here. So several times in past videos we've sort of had to use the following system to analyze a given topic right here. What we have is a metal plate right here and a metal plate right here. You can think of them like big sheets of aluminum foil or something. We're just looking at a cross section of view. It extends up towards us this way and into the page there. And what we've done is we, we've carefully kept the plates separated so they can't touch and we've connected them to a voltage source like a battery. And what the batteries can do, of course, the effect is that remember that the long edge of the battery is always the positive term when the short end is always the negative. And so a bunch of positive charges can end up flowing onto this top plate here. And a bunch of negative charges can end up flowing onto this bottom plate here. Uh, and so also what we know is going to occur here is in between the plates of the capacitors, electric field lines are going to appear like this. We've seen this a few times. They go out of the positive charges into the negative charges like that. And so what we essentially have here is a system where uh, top plate is positive charge, bottom plate is negative charge, electric field exists in between. So the question that we have not addressed now in the several times that we've used this system is, what do you think would happen if we remove the battery from this system? So we'll just take the battery off, we'll do something just like this. Very easy to do with an eraser, just take it off like that. Or electrically, you just uh, remove the wire that the battery is using to connect itself to the capacitor. So what do you think would happen? Does the charge stay? Does it go? Does it disappear or what? Well, it turns out in a case like this here, the charge actually stays right as is. Okay? The positive charge will all stay on that top plate, the negative charge will stay on that bottom plate here, and the electric field will persist in between the, the plates, that is, in this space in between the plates. Um, the most easy justification is where would the charge possibly go? Um, we have several models of charge that we're talking about here. On the lower plate, electrons have actually been deposited there, and on the upper plate, uh, Positive charges, remember, weren't actually deposited there, but negative charges were removed, leaving this plate net negative. So where would the electrons deposited on this lower plate go? Or alternatively, if electrons have been moved, removed from the, positive, from the top plate, how would they get put back on? This is sort of an isolated system. So indeed, the system persists like this, and that's exactly what capacitors are. Capacitors are devices here that store charge. Because in the case like this here, the battery is gone, but the system itself, the charge is still on there. And of course, the charge can be used for things like, for instance, if I had a capacitor like this, and I connected it maybe to something like a light bulb here. So here's sort of a little schematic of a light bulb right here. Here's a little filament in here. And light bulbs usually have a little base like this, and with maybe a connector there and a connector there. If I connect this positive plate to that terminal of the light bulb like that, and the bottom plate, say down here to this terminal right here, then what will happen is the charge will actually flow because the positive and negatives suddenly see an opportunity to get together and neutralize themselves. If you want to think about the force picture, this positive charge here will see this negative charge through the conducting path that goes through the wire and the light bulb. And since opposites attract, they will try to attract and sort of neutralize one another. Or alternatively, the electron deficient top plate will see the surplus of electrons on the bottom plate and try to grab some. And so what will happen is, of course, the light bulb will come on. It will it'll flash. And I say flash because oftentimes, although capacitors do store charge, the idea of using the charge often happens very quickly uh, for some common capacitance here. So oftentimes what we'll see is a light bulb simply flash on and off, which is an indicator that the positive charge has flowed and neutralized itself with a negative charge. But of course it depends on how much capacitance there are and how, there is and how much charge was stored. Sometimes light bulbs can stay on for a very long time if you've ever a very large capacitor. So that's in a nutshell what capacitors do, but let's even generalize this idea a bit more here because it doesn't have to look the way we've done it here. In fact, capacitors are so general that if you take any metallic object like this, I don't even know what this is, just say this is a ball of like aluminum foil that you've sort of crumbled up into a ball like you play with your cat with over here, and let's say this over here is, is a coin from the currency that you're in in the United States. It might be a quarter or something like that. So just something, just two metallic pieces. And if you took these two metallic pieces, and as long as you maintain this space between them here, you could connect them to a battery, just like we did with the orderly parallel pay system like that. As long as they're two metallic pieces, so there are the coins on the negative terminal, and here the aluminum foil that you play with your cat with is on the positive terminal. And yes, what would get it, what would happen here is because this is the positive terminal of the battery, the aluminum foil will be left let net positive, and the coin here will be negative. And of course, what will happen, just like in the parallel set plate system, is an electric field will exist between these two, this pair here. Now, it won't be as orderly as it was for the parallel plate system. That's why we like the parallel plate system. But the electric field lines might look all sort of wigged out and messy like this. But they will be there, and they will point out away from the aluminum foil since it's positive and towards the coin since it's negative here. 
So you will get your refill lines in here. And the same thing holds here that if you somehow maintained, didn't touch these things and maintain their space in between them, if you remove the battery, say just by erasing it like that, the charge on the aluminum foil would stay and the charge on the coin would stay as well. And so this, this two, these two systems here would be known to be storing charge. And so the aluminum foil coin system would also be considered a capacitor because it is storing charge. And just like in the other case uh, of the battery here, I can now take another piece of wire here and connect it maybe to a buzzer. Something that buzzes when you put run current through and you connect to the other side. And as soon as I make this connection right here, we'll hear a bzzz sound. Now the buzz might persist or it might be very quick depending on how much charge was stored and how much capacitance the system has, but that is evidence that charge was stored and it is now being discharged and used, say, in the case of the buzzer. There is a governing equation, governing equation for capacitance which says that Q, Q is equal to CV. This is sort of the easy one to remember, sort of the three-letter equation. I like to also put it like this, that C is Q over V. And so the literal interpretation of these equations then, this is a definition here, the interpretation of these equations then is that, I'll look at this one here, this is the one I like the most here, is that what capacitance really is, is the ability of an object to store charge at a certain voltage right here. That's really what capacitance means here. So it can store charge, and of course, at a given voltage. And if you take that, you take the amount of charge that seems to be stored, and you divide that by the voltage at which that charge is stored, that gives you this term called capacitance. And that, in a nutshell, is what it's all about there. The unit of capacitance is the farad, commonly abbreviated F. And if you go looking in the back of Radio Shack or in some simple electronics books and things like that, common circuits that people might build in front of them, the farad is actually a very large unit of capacitance here, is that commonly we'll have things like microfarads, meaning 10 to the minus 6 farads, or a millionth of a farad, or a picofarad, 10 to the minus 12 farads. Sometimes you'll see something like a millifarad, but it was sort of neat about uh, today's rapid technological advances is actually they have very large capacitors now that might even reach into just the F, into just the farad. In fact, if you go to the Internet and search for ultra capacitors, you can very easily find a 3,000 farad capacitor. You can store an enormous amount of charge. And if you've ever wondered how when your battery of your cell phone goes dead or some electronic devices need their battery change, how it maintains information, some of these devices actually have capacitors in them that store are storing charge that can actually power your device for a while while the batteries are removed. So that's sort of in a nutshell then what capacitance is all about. Um, and so just remember the definition here, sort of the, uh, the physics of it here is that you have two metallic objects separated by some distance and as long as you charge them up, you get positive charge on one side, negative charge on the other, and the defining equation for capacitance is that C is Q over V. How much charge can be stored at a given voltage? So let's talk just a bit more about these parameters here. So I'll just sort of go back to drawing the parallel plate capacitor because it's sort of like the, the easiest one here, but a parallel plate capacitor will look like this. These are the two metal objects here that are not allowed to touch, and of course they can be connected to a battery. So be careful with the symbols here because it looks a lot, the symbol for a capacitor does look a lot like the one for the battery, but remember the battery has the shorter terminal. This is the positive and this is the negative. And then the battery can also carry some voltage here. It might be 5 volts or 1.5 volts if it was a AA battery, or maybe 9 volts if it was one of the square block batteries, or 12 volts if it was a car battery, or if you had a power supply like in a laboratory or something like that, it could easily be 100 volts or even 1,000 volts or something like that. There is no set voltage at which you require to charge a capacitor up, but that's why the voltage appears in the capacitor equation. But no matter what voltage you choose here, you will get the positive charges flowing onto this plate right here because they're connected to the positive side of the battery and the negative charges flowing onto this plate because they're connected to the negative side of the battery and you will get that electric field between the two conductors which are forced to remain separate or else the capacitor would just sort of die here. And, well, how much charge do you get on those plates? Well, it depends on the three parameters here. But remember there that Q is equal to CV. So the amount of charge that you'll get stored on these plates here does depend on the voltage at which you charge up. And like you might guess, the higher the voltage, the more charge you get. But of course, all of it depends on how much capacitance the device as a, as a, as a device itself has. So this thing, well, let's put a little C here and say, well, if I draw two lines like this, separated by some distance, they'll have some capacitance. And the capacitance itself is a property of the two metals. So in other words, if I just take the two devices 
and separated by some distance like this, these two, P, these two conductors which are separated have some capacitance. Here's another uh, parallel plate capacitor where the plates might be separated a bit more. This one has some capacitance. Here's a system here that looks like a circle. We might put a conductor out here and a conductor inside of it. Well, this system has a capacitance. Or we might do something like, uh, you know, a couple balls like this, where here's a, a sphere like this, a metal sphere, and inside of this sphere here, we'll put another sphere. And they're both metallic, they're not touching, and so this system will have capacitance. So the reason why I'm telling you this is because this, this you see here is a property. It doesn't depend on charge or voltage or anything. Any two metal pieces that are separated by some distance has some capacitance. It's a property that it has. It can be measured, there's equations for it, and that kind of thing. But that is this property of just separating metal by, by some distance and leaving them separated like this. So this property here of metal that's separated. That's the property that we're talking about here. That leads to capacitance, and that is the C then that you put into this equation right here. And now when you combine the C, you put some voltage across this capacitor or this capacitor or this capacitor or this capacitor or alternately this system that has capacitance or this system that has capacitance or this system or this system here, then suddenly a charge will flow and the amount of charge that you get will be proportional to that voltage when you charge it. But of course, the proportionality constant sitting in between there is the amount of the capacitance, which is a property of the metal objects there. So we're just about ready to wrap up the video here, but what we'll do then is just to uh, highlight that last point here, that different arrangements of metal have different capacitances. So when I draw this, here's the first system right here. And so when I draw a system that looks like this, this is known as a parallel plate capacitor. Easy to see why. Two metal pieces that are sort of oriented parallel like that. And what happens then is that the capacitance of these two pieces of metal, just because they're sitting like that, has nothing to do with voltage or charge. It's the property of capacitance here is epsilon naught 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. Look in the front cover of your book or on Wikipedia times the area divided by the spacing between the plates. So it really matters what the spacing between the plates are. So the spacing here might be some distance d. Now where is the area? Well, remember that sheets are actually more like three-dimensional objects. So they sort of look like this here. This would probably be a more proper drawing of a parallel plate capacitor, sort of getting the sheets to go all the way back in like that, something like this. They're not touching here. This is just my, my perspective of my attempt at 3D drawing here. But you would have to agree with me that each one of these plates has some area A, A and A like that. And if I want to, then I could connect a wire like that and get the capacitor on the battery like this to get the charging to happen. But this is what this is what sort of a real parallel plate capacitor would look like, those sheets that I'm talking about. And that positive charge would be distributed all along this top sheet here and the negative charge would be distributed all along this bottom sheet right here. And yes, 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 the electric field would exist between the plates like that. I can start drawing some green electric field lines in there. And this is what that capacitance is all about. And I can remove the battery and the charge will remain. And so if the placing between this plates here is D and the area is A, this is the property called capacitance that those two sheets are going to have, epsilon naught A over D. So yeah, if you increase the spacing between the two metallic objects, the capacitance drops. But then if you start increasing the area, the capacitance goes up. It's all up to you. Those are your design considerations. But again, it is a property here. The capacitance doesn't depend on voltage or charge or anything like that. That's something else that you just decide to do with your system. The next system that we have here, commonly that you'll find, is a, uh, is a spherical capacitor system like I alluded to earlier. Uh, I'm not sure how something like this, like this would actually get built, but it is sort of a nice model anyway here. Take a big ball like this, like a big balloon that's actually metallic. I don't know where it comes from, maybe a globe or something like that. And somehow you suspend another smaller sphere inside of it like this. Let's see, my drawing is, is, it is what it is, but imagine the red sphere is inside that green one there. And again, these are two metallic spheres separated by some distance, and they're not allowed to touch. And it, like this equation up here for the parallel plate capacitor, this one will have some, some amount of capacitance also. So if this outer sphere here has a radius R, Two, let me get this right, and the inner one has a radius R1 here. The capacitance of this system here, a little bit different here, it's going to be 4 pi epsilon naught, and it's going to be the product of R1 times R2 over the difference between them, R2 minus R1, something like that. So, not a parallel plate capacitor system, different equation, but it is two metallic objects separated by some distance, and that's the only requirement for capacitance, and there's so a different equation for what the capacity of this system would have. And now if you had some way of 
connecting this thing to a battery, maybe a wire like this, and a wire that when sort of didn't touch the green sphere, maybe you could drill a very small hole in it and make this wire sort of go on there and get on the red sphere, you'd get the same thing. you get your positive charges falling onto the green sphere, a bunch of negative charges on the red sphere. Where would the electric field be? Of course, in the region between the spheres, you get this electric field sort of appearing in this region right here. And of course, the amount of charge that you get would be equal to CV, but C now comes from this equation, which is the geometrical properties of the object. So I'll erase as we look at just one last system and wrap this video up. Number three is what happens if the capacitor is sort of cylindrical. So in a case like this here, it's like you're taking two toilet paper tubes that are metallic and making a capacitor out of that. So you might have a long cylinder, or it doesn't have to be long, it just has to have some length L here. There's some length L like that. And we'll say that this outer one also has a radius of R2, something like that. R2. And what are we going to do? Well, inside of this one here, we'll put another cylinder that looks like this. Remember, these are all pieces of metal. They are not touching. This is just my perspective right here. And so what do we have again? We have two pieces of metal, and they're separated by some distance. That's the only requirement for capacitance. This is a cylinder here. Only requirement for capacitance, two pieces of metal separated by some distance. Here's another example right here. And if I want to know the capacitance of this, there is an equation for this. It's equal to 2 pi times L, so that length would matter in there, times epsilon, that famous constant which keeps popping up in all these uh, electrical equations and discussions here, times the log of R2 divided by R1. So there is a, a third equation for capacitance that has to do with cylindrical capacitors. And yes, of course, all the properties hold. If you connected a wire to this outer one right here, onto a battery, then another wire onto the inner one like that, all this positive charge will flow onto this outer cylindrical shell, a bunch of negative charge will flow onto this inner conductor right here, and the amount of charge that either will store will be the definition of capacitance Q is equal to CV, and you choose the voltage at which you want your battery to charge the capacitor up against. You can always use higher voltages to store more charge, but you have to remember, though, if you the higher voltage you get, since these are two metallic pieces next to each other, if the voltage gets too high, then what actually can happen is you can get the equivalent of a little spark or a lightning bolt existing between these two objects like that. It will neutralize and you will often damage your capacitor. So oftentimes capacitors do have maximum voltages at which you can charge them to avoid such damage like that, in which case the capacitor just won't work anymore. So you just can't keep going as high as you want. Voltage get more and more charged. There are physical limitations. So there you go. A nutshell of capacitors. Capacitance Q is equal to CV. Capacitance is the ability of two separated metals to store charge. And we looked at three systems, the parallel plate capacitor, the spherical capacitor, and the cylindrical capacitor. All are valid capacitors and all have different equations for how much capacitance they have.